Welcome everyone in the LinkedIn community. I'm Craig Wartman and on behalf of my friend, John Register and me, we are very thankful to all of you out in the community. We're thankful to LinkedIn for letting us have this opportunity to join you live. And John, I'm thankful to you. Um, thank you for being here with me today. Oh, I'm, I'm honored. This is great. What a, what a timely way to have a great conversation today. So thank you for, for hosting. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm delighted. Um, I will just share, John, if it's okay, the, the super quick backstory about how we got to this today uh, and joining each other on, on LinkedIn Live and, and welcoming our communities in. And then um, what I thought I would do is just frame up our conversation and then really pass it to you to frame the, the, the bigger picture and conversation we're having. Is that okay if I do that? Absolutely. Okay, my friend. So let's do it. So how did we get to today? Um, I have been a, uh, a, a fan and friend of John Register for some time. And John, I'll ask you as you begin to, to tell a bit of your backstory, but our backstory together is we are both authors and we're both uh, teachers and we're both professional speakers. And thanks to a mutual uh, client who are, we were just talking before we went live, who are also mutual friends of ours, we were put on a stage together and that was a a heck of an experience for me. And I just got to watch you perform. And then I actually got to jump on the stage with you. And that was quite an honor and a delight. And, and, and we got to know each other. And, and then as we got to know each other, um, we had what I would consider, and please tell me if I'm overstating this, John, but it considered to be a, a crucial conversation earlier this week, just about everything that's happening. And in that conversation, again, once again, I learned a lot from you. And at the end of that conversation, you'll recall that we sort of said to each other, why don't we do this, sort of do it again or try to repeat it again and do it live so we can pull other people into this conversation. So so that's that's how we got to today. And, mm -hmm. and again, John, uh, correct my any errors I've made. But if you would jump in and just tell us a little bit about you, uh, your amazing story and then sort of how how you would frame up this conversation, if you would. Sure. Yeah. And I, I love how you called me an author, right? Because I, <laughs> I just wrote a book. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe it. Uh, little old me. Uh, it's, it's, it's done because all I wanted it to be was done. Right. <laughs> but my backstory is this kind of think of it framing as a riches to rags to riches storyline. I was a world class athlete, went to the University of Arkansas, graduated with a degree in communication and was a four time All-American while I was there. I then enlisted in the United States Army and served for six years, went to the Gulf War, and was a part of the Army's world-class athlete program, which helps uh, service members to maintain or try to reach their dreams of becoming a, a member of the United States Olympic team. And so that program still exists today. It was on May 17, 1994, when I was training for the Olympic trials, that I went across a hurdle in the 400 meter hurdles, landed awkwardly, dislocated my left knee upon that landing, severed the artery behind the kneecap, and seven days later became an amputee. And from that, I really began, as everybody throws out the, the, the new normal word out there right now, uh, I was in a dark place. I was, I was going down a downward spiral. I was trying to figure out who I am now. What's my identity? Will my wife still stay with me? And it was in that moment that she said, you know what, we're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. She said that back in 1994. And we began to retool. And I re realized that the new normal was not a destination. It was actually a plateau to grow. And I built a career around that uh, and went to the Paralympic Games for athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairments uh, twice, 1996 in Atlanta, and then 2001, the Paralympic silver medal in the long in the long jump. I actually have the medal here. I didn't know I got the medal. Boop, boop. Um, and uh, was working for the United States Olympic Committee along the way and built out what's called the um, military sport program for wounded, ill and injured service members, which turned into Warrior Games, which turned into Prince Harry's Invictus Games. And I began to find this niche around framing these conversations that are kind of difficult between the disability community and the, uh, the, the what I call the non-disabled community uh, and trying to understand what that's like. And I found so many parallels to the civil rights movement and how to move conversations forward and coming from that that we're in this point of time right now thought it really important to have these conversations and looking at it from different lenses uh and so i'm, I'm really thankful for all the people that have called me including craig you know when you called 
to ask, you know, hey, how are you doing and how, how are you feeling as well as, you know, what can I do to be an ally and, and support? And so that means that people are beginning to really listen to what's already been a part of that um, that vernacular for many black Americans in this country. And no matter where you start that conversation, whether it's George Floyd or it's Breonna Taylor or it's, it's uh, Trayvon Martin or uh, Rodney King, or it's 400 years ago, wherever you come to that point of realization that something is not quite right in America when it comes to people of color. Why are there so many people of color uh, disproportionately in the prison systems? And we go back to some of the things that we'll talk about and get into today with how we frame things and what we see in society. I saw it in the disability community, and I see it, of course, as an app through the uh, eyes of an African-American male in this country. So I'll turn it back to you and we can begin our dialogue. John, thank you for doing that. You know, I, I just a couple of thoughts. I mean, what you just described in your incredible journey is one of the things other than our friendship that precipitated my call to you, because as you know, we're both teachers. So we, you know, one of the things I teach in my classroom is how to have crucial conversations. And yes. I need to be really careful here. I'm still learning a lot about how to do that because it is by nature difficult. It's why they call them difficult or crucial conversations. And so there were so many levels or layers of why I sought you out and wanted to talk with you. And I'm thankful that you're doing this with me together. What you and I had talked about as we wrapped up our first set of conversation was a couple of things that we wanted to pursue today. And again, please correct any framing errors I make. But one of them was how do we even find our way into these conversations? Given mm. we come from different backgrounds, we have different color skin, we have different life journeys. Yours, we talked about this, yours and my experience are, you know, on, on their face, they're similar. We both have come to the same place. We stand on a stage together, we're speakers, we're authors. But as we discussed the other day, we have totally different life experiences. So how do we as people from every end of that spectrum, or maybe it's a circle and we're all from coming in from different perspectives, how do we get in? And then what really among the many things you shared with me on the phone the other day, what struck me was you also were very crisp about what we do moving forward. So how do we get in? And then there's sort of that, I don't know, fat middle, if you will, that right, we have right. to work our way through. And then what do we do moving forward? And so- yeah. Please, yeah, I in. think that's right. I think that, you know, how we get in is just how we how we've gotten in. And there are, like I said, there are different experiences that we all come from with different backgrounds. And just because you've had your experiences and you have lived a life up until this point, it could be very different from someone else's experience. And because of that, we have to learn how to listen one to another. Uh, I think we, we find out right now, right? How many people were aligned with Drew Brees when he made his comments the other day and said, you know, that that's right, Drew, you know, it's, it's about the flag. It's about all this stuff. And then every, the entire community went in and said, if you are still thinking that kneeling is about a flag, you just have missed the entire point, right? And so now Drew has backed, retracted that and backed it up a little bit and said, how can I now listen? I, I understand that my stats and how I've gotten to where I am in this moment in time is because I've been thrown to a lot of people that don't look like me and they're great in their own right. And they've had a different experience in America than I have had. But we all are Americans because that's the fabric, uh, fabric of, our, of our society. So as we get into these conversations, I think it's doing what Drew did and just say, okay, I need to sit back. I'm not an expert here. Let me listen and lean in to, uh, to really hear, understand what is going on that I don't yet really understand. Because when you think about that statement, right, and, and, and we'll get into, well, I want to get into hijacking conversations. Because when you look at this, when you look at, let's take George Floyd right now, and the atrocity that just happened, and this going viral, not in America, this is around the world. I have friends from Kazakhstan, from uh, Uzbekistan, Singapore, Japan, all calling me, checking in to see how I'm doing in the United States. Well, I'm and I'm ticked off, you know, I'm pissed for, for the most part, but that's not my entry point. George Floyd is not my entry point. And so we have to begin to understand that I've been dealing with this a very long time, my entire lifetime, and I'll get into that. But it's not even me, it's my father that taught me some of the things that I have to do to show up. And then you 
we look at the splintering of this, right? So we go from George Floyd to now that the media takes us into the protesters. And we begin to lump protesters all into one group. And it's very different. Protesters are not agitators. Agitators are not necessarily looters or vandals. Because when you look at how everything moves, protesters have come up to protest what they saw as an injustice and they want their voices heard. And then they want to work with uh, uh, the, the, the authorities that might be out there to actually make those changes put in place. At, uh, the, the agitators come in there to try to hijack conversations. Total different group. They want their message heard, but maybe they didn't get on the agenda and now they're ticked off and they want their voice heard. And how you suppress a, uh, an agitator that might be in the protest to incite is you don't give them voice, you don't give them power, you don't listen to them. And a looter or a vandal, they're not, that, they're not either. They come in when the police start coming to, to get everybody out of there, that's when they know that the eyes are not on them and it's like a magic trick where everybody looks this one direction and they slide of hand start going out and, and taking the things that they want. They're criminals. So you cannot put protesters in, but many times the conversation will get hijacked. And that hijacking comes to, oh, let's now focus on the vandalism. Let's now focus on the economics of what just happened and all these things. But if we walk it back, we have to go to the original point of what got us there in the first place. We would never have protests if George Floyd was not murdered. We would never had the agitators if we didn't have the protesters who were protesting because George Floyd got murdered. We never would have had all of this looting, fires, vandalism going on if the agitators didn't incite in the side of the protesters because George Floyd was murdered. That is what we need to continue to keep the conversation on and then cause real change in that moment right there, not the other stuff and the splintering of everything else. And that's one way that that uh, that um, allies can really dig in is to any time they hear the conversation going off in this direction, demanding that the media turns it back onto the original intent. You know, so you just made me understand something from our earlier conversation that I was wrestling with, and that is you, you, you use this really interesting and very tough phrase with me the other day where you said, Craig, we've got to return to the scene of the crime. And, right. and that's, you know, that's what you just said, John. And what I, here's what I was struggling with. And I remember asking you this and we, we, we were dancing around it, but I, 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 I was wondering like when, when we've lost our ability to do nuance, meaning we come to a conversation unilaterally and say, okay, all these people are criminals. When what you just pointed out is, wait a second, folks, there's nuance here. I mean, there's at least three different types of people. Well, and, 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 and John, I would actually add another category of people, which are maybe people like me or my kids who are right alongside with your daughter, but, you know, are, and, and are, are trying to, to support and trying to figure out what their role is. There's all kinds of these categories of people. My question is, how the heck do we find the nuance? And, I, and, I, and, and what you just answered, or I think the beginning, the, seeding, the seedling of an answer is we have to demand that our media give us nuance. We have to demand nuance in these conversations and say, well, wait a second, let's, let's parse this and put protesters here and looters here and agitators here. Is that, I mean, first of all, is that what you're saying? And how else why, might we get to a more nuanced understanding of and find our way into this conversation? Yeah, I, that, that's great. And, and yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that there will be a splinter of a conversation. And we see, you can just go back and look at Trayvon Martin, look at uh, Brianna Taylor, all the, oh, she hasn't even, the, the officers haven't even been charged in that one yet. And okay. she was working on COVID-19 stuff. She was a nurse and trying to help people out and they barged in on her and shot and, and there's no charges right now, even on that. So how do we show up? We have to go back to that, that point of where the crime actually occurred. And we can't look with a blind eye to say that, well, because it doesn't happen in my community, that means it just doesn't happen. Because we see around the world that it does happen and we're beginning to wake up to it. We can't let that, like I said, the conversation be hijacked. So seeing the nuances is first being able to see how people in various situations are being actually treated and then lending voice to those individuals. So, um, you know, one of the things we talk about points of, of, of where the scene of the crimes happened, right? So for me, growing up, I, was, I grew up on the west side of Chicago, Oak Park, Illinois, 
And for the most part, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty good. But there were times and there was a point where every African-American and I would also say every person with a disability finds out that they're being treated differently. Yeah. And for me, uh, it happened at least three times and I won't get into all the times, but at least three times. And I'll just I'll just share one with you right now. And that had to do with, you know, everybody has probably gone out if they have a father uh, and bought a Father's Day card. So I went out with a white friend of mine. His name is Michael Ryan. And we go out to Weebolt's department store. Uh, old Weebolt's is on Harlem Avenue out there in Chi-Town and uh, in Oak Park. And the card section was down in the basement. So we ride the yellow escalator down and we're perusing the cards down there. And he decides there's nothing here that he wants to get for his dad. So he goes out and across the street to another store. And I said, yeah, I'll just meet you over there. I'm going to keep on looking. And so I kept on looking at the court the, the, in the store. I'm about 13, 14 years old at this point. Uh, it's summer, you know, June time. And as I don't see anything, I, I'm going to go join my friend, my white friend across the street. And as I get up, ride the escalator up, about to walk outside the door, a pl plainclothes uh, undercover security guard catches me takes me, throws me up against the big window where everybody can see, spreads, spreads me eagle, and then begins to frisk me up and down my body, whispering to my ear, says, I know you took something. When I find it on you, you know you're going, don't you? And then he used, you know, an ex expletive I won't use on here. Now, I'm a 14-year-old kid. I'm just trying to buy a Father's Day card for my dad with my friend. My friend Michael wasn't accosted like that. It was only me. And I was so traumatized that I went back home got my dad and he then walked me through a whole scenario of how to uh, approach this and how we're going to, to deal with this situation. And at the end of it, we were able to go back up uh, and, and I was able to confront the gentleman as well as, as his immediate supervisor. And we got a letter saying that he was released from his job. So that taught me some things. It taught me that, you know, as hard and frog as I wanted to be in, in my fight, that I could be more effective if I knew how to script and have a conversation at varying levels. So I can have a conversation yeah. with Prince Harry and I can go right into the hood and have another conversation with, with, uh, with those that might be, be selling stuff on the street in Hispanic or, or other communities. How many people on this call can actually do that or are afraid to go into those type of communities? But if we don't have those type of language skills to do it, to have difficult conversations, we will never begin to truly understand the other individual. John, what... I can't help but point out, and you and I talked about this the other day, and you shared that story with me, among others, is, and you know this from our work together on a stage, I spend most of my weeks and months and years thinking about the power of story. And one of the things I, I wanted to just suggest to all of us is part of how we find nuance is hearing each other's stories. And so, John, when and I mentioned this to you when we talked, I mean, I was struck by your stories because my reaction was, as a white man, I've never even, A, I've never been through that. B, I've never even been close to it. And so, but, and when we have conversations and we approach these conversations, one of, I think, one of the main doors into this conversation is, and you, you know, you said listening and hearing and, you know, empathizing and understanding. I think the best way for us to do that is to, or, or I'm proposing one of the ways to do that is simply to say, tell me your story. Yeah. And then we can share stories. You know, you shared a story and I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but you shared a story about John Jr. That just, I mean, it just stopped me because we have kids at similar age. And I had just had a conversation with my two amazing kids, my daughter and my son. And then you told me the story about John Jr. And I just, I, I, and I'd love to have you, if you don't mind, share Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But I think, you know, one thing I want to go back to one of the things you said about that, you know, you weren't close to it, but we really are close to it. We're closer than we think. We just aren't, our eyes are just aren't open to it because yeah. we are coming at it from a different lens. Yeah. And so, so how many times have we heard people say this in our office settings? How many times have we heard people say that there is an injustice and we just don't hear it because we're not in the space to hear it. We don't believe it's actually happening. We think we're going to attribute it to something else that the media might have hijacked. You know, Colin Kaepernick kneeling on the flag. How many of us really want to understand what he was kneeling for now? Right. So those are the things that weren't there, but the conversation gets hijacked away from what the original intent was. And, you know, if, if anybody if they're chatting out there right now, how many um, how many people were of color 
were at the time killed with their hands behind their back, handcuffed in police custody of what Colin Kaepernick was was um, was standing for, uh, kneeling for at that point in time, and how many have been killed since. So right. that's the hard question that we got to keep returning the conversation to if we're really going to have authentic conversation around it. And so the story you're talking about with my son is something that came from my dad, right? So my dad tells me when I'm learning how to drive, make sure that if you get stopped by the police officers, um, and I'm not, this is not a jump on police officers thing because I, I have great friends who are, who are on the force and they're, they're amazing individuals uh, that do a great service. Uh, but I'm just talking about rooting out the, the bad ones that are there and we can do that. There is a way in this to do that and we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But my dad told me at 10 and two, have your hands, make sure that your registration is out of the glove compartment so you're not reaching for something that might cause or incite the, the person that actually has their hand on their weapon and you're, you don't have a handle weapon because that's how afraid some people are of you as a threat that you might be reaching for a weapon to actually cause harm for their for their life. Police officers are, 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 are taught to close the gap, right, to make sure that that there is there's nothing that can happen between them, except when a person runs away from them, that gap is opened up. So the threat is gone. So that's you know, when you shoot somebody in the back like that, that's a whole nother whole nother story. But my dad said 10 and 2. Um, and that's what he told me. And I, every time I was stopped, that's what I remembered. And so I passed that down to my son because I know we know as black men, we're going to get stopped by police officers, especially if we're driving a nicer car. And so I had a, an old beat up, <laughs> um, Mercedes, like it was four by 40. He had to roll the windows down to get the, you know, get the air conditioning to come in. Uh, the only thing that was really great on that car was the motor. And so, uh, so John had that car is going to drive it down to Texas to go to school. And I said, look, John, when you get in Texas, your chance of getting stopped in this car are really high, really high. So here's what you need to do. If an officer stops you, hands it 10 and 2. Make sure that your registration and license are out to be seen so you don't have to reach for the license at all. We're going we're gonna to have one of our police officer friends, a buddy of mine, fraternity brother, come over and look at the car before you get on the road just to make sure there is nothing on here that could – warrant a stop. So my friend came over, we walked around the vehicle, all lights are working, the tail lights are working, the, the, the signal lights are working, the license plate is visible, uh, there's no obstructions in the back window. Everything that we could do to make sure that car was worthy to be on the road. And, um, and so he took off, we went down, and no more than 20 minutes, him getting into the state of Texas, from Colorado into Texas, I get a call from him and said, Dad, I'm being pulled over. And I said, remember what we said? I said, this is what you have to go through and just make sure everything is there. So when the officer shines a light in the car, it was dark, that they can see everything right there and make no moves in that situation. And he, he made it made it through. But even him doing that, I am terrified sitting with my wife in my bed, waiting for the call for him to say I'm on my way again. I'm terrified because I don't know what cause they are trumping up on him to stop him because my police officer friend fraternity brother just looked at the car not six hours prior to that and nothing was wrong with it so i know it's a dirty stop i know it is and i don't know if he's going to survive it that is my truth in that and and no one can take that away from me but it's it's the point of being able to listen to that truth and understand i had that experience he had that experience and i shared that experience from my dad to me to pass on to him what one of the many things that struck me john about that story that you told me the other day about john jr is and i said this to you on the phone and it seems i'm hesitant almost to say it because it seems like a sort of a crass economic argument, but just think about the waste. Like what a, what a waste of your time. And, and I know, again, I know that's only one sort of scale of, of the problem, but uh, you know, as I said to you the other day, like I, that not only did I not do that with my son and my daughter, my wife yeah. and I, when they learned how to drive, I, and, and, but I never, I never, it never even occurred to me to do that. And not to mention I mean, did I lay in bed at night wor worrying about them and getting there safely? Yes. But think about all the depth of other layers of worry that you and your wife had that would never even occur to me. And so yeah, I, I was I was dressed. I was I had keys. I was getting ready if I needed to. 
to go down to the town that he told me that he was in and get in my car and go down there to try to get him out of jail if 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 need be. Um, and that was that was in my head at that more, point in time. So, OK, so, John, um, I'm going to I'm going to make this slightly harder for us in this crucial conversation before we turn to our our second and last part, which is, you know, what do we do moving forward? Yeah. Here's the question. What if you and I came to this conversation? Like, what do we do when you and I come to this conversation? I'm a white man. You're a black man. And we come from completely different worlds. Like I have one set of media that I look at. You have a different. And, and by the way, you and I should both state out loud. We admitted to each other that we also you and I fall victim to that ourselves where Absolutely. we, you know, we are also in echo chambers. And I would never deny that to anyone who would listen. And so that's on me. And right. so you and I both admitted that to each other. But let's just make this more the harder. Like, what if I come to this conversation and I am the guy who is saying, you know, John, these 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 crazy people, they're all criminals that, they're, you know, I look at the news and I see these these huge crowd of people. And first of all, they're idiots for being out in the covid and then they're idiots because they're they're looting all these innocent people's stores. And, you know. That I am coming from a completely different background, like how what what's yeah. What, what do we do there? I, I begin asking questions. And sometimes the leading questions are sometimes just questions for me to understand, you know, what, where is this coming from in the, in the person and begin to help them to articulate what they're saying? Because generally what I have found, and at least for me, is that most people that say things like this, they're very generic terms because they've heard it from somebody else and they haven't really done the work for themselves to go deeper into their own conversations uh, and, and, to, and to really understand why they think what they think. And it's tough in this society, like you were talking about with echo chambers, with little pixels that follow you around. Um, and you, you know, think about a pair of shoes and all of a sudden it shows up in your Facebook feed, right? Uh, so we have these echo chambers that are, are relevant to us. I believe that we have to really understand to have a global perspective around this and to bring a global perspective into the conversation. Most Americans do not own a passport. And of those most Americans, they haven't really traveled outside, that, don't own, that do not own a passport, have not traveled outside their own states, sometimes not even out of their own counties. And so because that we have those, that happens in our, and, and, and for various reasons, right? We have a big country, uh, for, we're on a big island. But if you haven't really traveled outside of the United States and you haven't seen things from a global lens to understand that what the media is portraying here might not really be true over, over overseas someplace. An example, the things I was hearing my wife and my cousin telling me and my father when I was in the Gulf War were not the same things I was seeing on the ground. So what are you talking about? Right. And so they were getting a different message a spun message back at home that I was experiencing uh, uh, in, in real time. So there's different layers of it. So getting yourself out of that echo chamber as much as you can, really I think is one of the first pieces to recognize that you are actually in an echo chamber and you are getting just like that, um, that widget or shoe pops up in your Facebook feed, you're getting your ideals the same way. You're only getting the, the same things that you're thinking about fed to you. So you got to bust out of that thing. And so listening to other news sources, listening to places from outside the United States, how do other people perceive, will give you a broader perspective and a greater perspective for those particularly who have not traveled outside the United States. And so when you think about that, right, there are people because they are so narrow vision, they cannot hear another truth because their truth is the more critical truth. Their truth is, has been given down to them by people who are stalwarts in their family. And so that has to be the truth. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily. So we can begin to look at other things that are out there. Well, truth is always going to be the truth. We, we have facts that are manipulated and changed around. So with inside of with with all of that going on, we really have to open up our ears and listen and open up our hearts to listen and empathize rather than jumping in and saying, well, I don't think that's really the case. And if the and that that's being said, my case, for example, me saying that or somebody else saying that, why am I believing what I'm believing? And can I go back once again to the scene of the crime? Yeah. Right. And that's that's the biggest piece of it. And that's 
where the rubber meets the road. And most of the time, as many people, polit um, leaders have said, once you get people doing that, the arguments begin to fall away. They, they say, well, I don't know how, how do I get to that point in the first place? And we can begin to have those more crucial conversations at a deeper level. I think that's, I, I think that's really interesting. What you, what you make me think about when you talk about, you know, people not being outside of the country. I remember John starting my career in Washington, DC, and that was at a moment in time, a weird moment in time where a lot of congressmen, and they were mostly men, were ripping up their passports. And I, I was bothered by that. And I didn't, I was young, so I didn't know really why I was bothered by that. But that's why. I mean, it's, it's almost like today, even as Americans and colleagues like you and I are, it's like we have to have a, we have to have a passport to just talk to each other. And, we, and you know, we don't, we don't need a passport. I don't need a stamp. Right. But right, we have right. to have the conversations. And so what, what I also, what I also want to just add, and then we'll start sort of turning the corner here, if, if that's yeah. okay with you is Absolutely. one of the things I've learned in teaching crucial conversations. And again, I've just read a lot and I'm still learning no question, but, um, Adam Grant, I think at Wharton and a whole bunch of people that he researched and, and, and read about have said, you know, when when you find yourselves in these conversations, one of the best ways you can come to understanding is to make the most respectful interpretation of the other's position. Mm -hmm. And I say that over and over and over to myself mm -hmm. and in my classroom, because like anybody, I get stressed. I get stressed in these conversations and I kind of, you know, don't lash out, but I, you know, I'll, I'll raise my voice and, and get stressed when I feel strongly about something. And I, I constantly have to remind myself, like, make the most respectful interpretation. You may not agree, but make the most respectful interpretation, because then between what you've mentioned, John, listening, asking questions, empathizing, telling stories, making these interpretations of what you're hearing, those are the ways not only into these conversations, but through these conversations to yeah. another side that may be meaningful for some, for, for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was as, a, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how we how we do shift and how we do turn. And one of the things uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, a sociologist out of he, he was with the, with the San Francisco 49ers. He has a, um, a an emeritus at, uh, I think, UC Berkeley. Um, he talks about uh, mo mostly from the black athlete standpoint, but I was asking some questions around um, disability and how to push forward in some spaces that I just couldn't figure it out, still can't figure it out. But uh, he said, you know, in order to have sustainable change, John, you, you have to have three things in place. One is you have to have a um, a, a, a demand of, of, of any, anybody that's that's trying to to be into the group, a, a, a talented group of a pipeline of successful individuals. So you got to have that kind of first, right? Uh, a, a talented pipeline of individuals. The second thing you have to have is a persistent and a pervasive demand. So somebody's saying that this talent that we have that is qualified to do this work, they need to go somewhere. That we need to advocate for that group. And then third, the the institution that's being impressed upon to change actually has to want to change. And if you have all three of those things together, you have the perfect storm and change happens really quick. When I built the Paralympic military sport program, those things align really fast and we were able to to make very quick strides in the program to service our wounded ill injured service members mm -hmm. but in other areas it's it's not as fast right you look at say uh augusta nationals back in 2012 when the i, I believe it was the ibm ceo who sponsored the tournament for the first time was a woman well all the other men that were before were awarded or got the green jacket as their uh, an, an entry point, you know, and a thank you for their sponsorship. Uh, but they wouldn't give the, the green jacket to the woman. So the pervasive demand rises up and says, hey, we have, we have a talented pool of women who are executives and CEOs now. Why aren't you giving her the green jacket? Oh, we are like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, and we don't want to really uh, have that in our purview. We want to keep this a, a, an all-male club so she does not get that jacket. And they said, no, the heck no, that's not going to happen. So the pervasive demand rose up, and they bowed to the pervasive demand eventually and picked two. They did a quota because when you when you do that, you get a quota system. And the two were Condoleezza Rice and Darla Moore, businesswoman out of uh, South Carolina. And those two were the first two women in uh, Augusta. Uh, so we see this from a press of 
the pervasive demand demanding, right? So protesters demanding that change actually happens. And then they the pressure is so great that the, the status quo must change. Status quo will never change without pressure. Right. Boston Tea Party, we can go back there. There was a riot. There was a huge unrest. Do not think that America was formed and forged by not having any type of violence. We had a huge civil war. Uh, we had a break in the war from the Revolutionary War from Great Britain. So there is always a press, pressure, violence that will take what they want um, from the, the people that have the status quo. That happens hist historically over, over time. We can just always go back to, to that. So never think that because that is another hijacking of the conversation. Yes. Right. So, so, so you and I, and you, you partially answered this, this question, John, as we sort of turn to what do we do moving forward in, the, in this conversation and for the benefit of our, our, of our community here. Yeah. But so you started to answer this question and I, and you didn't, you and I did not talk about this the other day, but I want to ask it. What is, what is the unit of change? I mean, one of the things that my brain does always is I'm on zoom level. So I, I zoom all the way into two friends talking, you know, the unit of two friends talking or, yeah. or a family unit. And then you zoom out a little bit and you have a social structure and you zoom out a little bit and you have a municipality, a city, you know, your neighborhood, whatever you zoom out. And, you know, eventually, you, you know, you zoom out to the protests and then you zoom all the way out to leadership with quotes around it from Congress and our judicial branch and our executive branch. So where what's the unit is it, and is the answer all like what's the unit of change, do you think? Oh, I, I think people come in at different levels, at, you know, of where they are. So. At the at the most micro level, when if people are coming in this conversation at, at George Floyd, OK, let me understand what's going on, because that is just not right. And if anybody thinks that's right, then you have a, a, or of your friends, you have to have a conversation there and saying, what at all do you think is right about this scenario? Yeah. And you're trying to justify and splinter the conversation. So you got to keep that thing right there. And Sorry. then from there, what can I do to engage and actually listen to help? Um, so I'm going to reach out to my friends. So that's a natural occurrence. A lot of my uh, friends of color are being reached out to uh, our friends who are of uh, European descent. And they're saying, you know, A, um, how are you feeling? You know, <laughs> which I think is kind of a question. How would you feel if one of your brothers and sisters was murdered? How would you how, how are you feeling right now? Right. When you just saw that. Um, so that's all of us should be shocked and, and, and just just totally uh, taken to a different level with that. But at the same time, how can I help begins to be the the way that we can listen, because many of the the uh, the blacks in America, Africans in America, uh, they're already dealing with this. This is nothing new. This right. is just another peg on the board. Uh, this has happened because the police force. Remember, the origination of the police force just didn't come by happenstance. It came to catch runaway slaves. That's where we begin the conversation, right? So we, wherever you come to this conversation, you got to bring it back to that point of origin. But there are some very tangible things that you need to do. You need to begin to change that vernacular inside the family, the family dynamic and saying, this has happened. How do we deal this as a family unit? Yeah. How do, what are you experiencing? And begin to get the emotions out inside of that family, whatever that family is. And then begin to see how you can plug in to be an advocate. We were we were advocates for you know gay lesbian rights. We're advocate for disability rights. We're advocates for women's rights. We're advocates. When are we going to advocate for African Americans that are being treated like this or other people, brown, uh, black and brown skinned people uh, in our country? And so that's where we can turn the corner and actually put our how do we activate? Well, there's some really tangible ways that we can do that. So. So, John, we've got a question from the LinkedIn community that I want to read to you and then we'll and then we'll start to talk about uh, and just close up with some 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 actions moving forward. Is that OK? Sure. So a, 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 a guy named Mike Jackson is asking, how do we scale these stories and this education and these skills to have crucial conversations? How do we scale that? That's a really good question. Right. And I, I would answer that by saying there are a lot of there are a lot of scaling that's already happened, right? It's now at a point of trying to catch up to where everybody, every, where everybody else is. So when you look at uh, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration and, and Age of Colorblindness, uh, you look at The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, Me and White Supremacy by Layla F. Saad, uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, My Angelou, uh, Black Feminist Thought. Th there's so many 
resources that are out there. It's just that now we're coming to it. One of the greatest resources that you can just listen to with your children, this amazing podcast that's out there right now, is the 1619 Project. Yes. Just to understand that every single thing in America, from the banking systems to mortgages to um, how we structure our work environment, all began and has its root in slavery. That is just a conversation. You want to start someplace, 1619 Project is absolutely a great way to scale the conversation. Well, and you, I have one, just one tiny addition to add to your amazing list. You know, you know, also, John, I talk a lot online and off about how to read a book. And so I'm, yeah. I'm a reader and my favorite, partially because he's just an incredibly gifted writer is Ta-Nehisi Coates. I went back this week and read uh, the, I think it was published originally in the Atlantic, the case for reparations. And mm -hmm. it talk about a history lesson, like the 1619 project, it is a clinic on how to write a history. And it is one of the best long form pieces of journalism I have ever read in my life. And I've read a heck of a lot. And so yeah. I would just add that to the list and maybe, you know, again, I'm putting you on the spot. Maybe you and I could collaborate on a quick list that we can post on Absolutely. our yeah. various platforms. For sure. So, so John, what, you know, quickly through part two, what's the move? What do we do? What, what's the move forward? What, what are you telling people? I'll share with what I'm telling folks. Yep. What, are, what are you suggesting we do as a result of conversations like this and, and yeah. just the time that we are in? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the first thing is, A, you're, we're asking questions, right? How, how do I engage? How do I help? And there are, after what we have seen on, with, with uh, Mr. George Floyd and, and that atrocious murder, what, we've, what we are seeing is people starting to come out and asking what they can do. And one of the things is if you listen to um, uh, President, uh, former President Obama had a great session that was on a couple of days, maybe it was yesterday or two days ago. Day, day, before, um, yesterday. Yeah. day before yesterday. It was a great program. A lot of activists, a lot of leaders in the spaces when he was in office that he put together for times such as this. Uh, to have the conversation to move forward long past his presidency. So he's thinking about legacy the entire time. And one of the things that came up was the Eight Can't Wait, yes. uh, Eight Can't Wait project, which is um, it's, uh, if you go to eightcantwait.org, you will see that, you know, because we're all driven by data. We want the numbers. We want to know what's what's going on. Well, the data shows that if law enforcement, um, uh, these eight pol policies can de decrease police violence by 72%. And I'm just going to kind of read them out to you, and then you can kind of go to 8cantwait.org and engage. And on that website, you can look for your local um, police department, sheriff's department, mayor's office to see what they are have put in place right now. And you can actually make a telephone call. They, they don't need any type of legislation. They don't have to call a special meeting. They can, with a stroke of a pen, do these eight things which are proven to reduce police violence by 72% banning chokeholds and, and, uh, and strangleholds, requiring de-escalation, uh, de require warning before shooting, uh, requires exhaustive alternatives before shooting, duty to intervene, ban shooting at moving vehicles, require use of force continuum, and require comprehensive reporting. All those eight things right there reduce the fatalities of people being locked up, handcuffed behind their back, and losing their life in police custody. That is a real thing that you can do right now. But I'm going to caution you, as soon as you call, you're going to be on the list. Because this fraternal order police, they are really tight-knit group, and you can see the power that they have. And there's some great officers inside of there that un underneath this, it it's, it's going to be a tough conversation. It'll be a hard conversation, and you're going to get backtracked. And, you, and the, again, as we've always been saying, remember that you can turn the conversation back to the statistics that are in your neck of the woods. This happens at the local level. It's not going to happen from top down. John, that's great. And on your prompting the other day, I went to eight can't wait. And I, I, and you know, we're both fellas from Chicago or Chicago area. And the last one of the, the comprehensive reporting Chicago. And I look, I love Chicago and I was delighted to see they checked most of those boxes, but comprehensive reporting. And I, I couldn't, Transparency. Why, why wouldn't why would right. reporting not be on there? And so and, and so I'm going to go further. I'm going to cut you off and go further because I just was talking Please. to a representative yesterday. I live in Colorado Springs and we have three of the eight that are on there. Right. And so when I was talking with one of my representatives, we have a bill that's before um, our, our, our state, our, our legislator right now is 
that in that reporting, right, just to wear body cam, they're resisting that because, oh, I forgot to turn on my body camera. So whenever you hear that, the body camera is to protect you, to make sure that you're doing the stop the correct and the right way and we can review it, have data, have statistics around it. So we know how to approach a vehicle and have our hand on weapon, close the distance. We know how our partner can go around the other side. And so that's a part of police procedures. So why can't the part of the police procedures be, oh, I, I forgot to do that, right? I forgot to turn my body cam. Yeah. No, that, that's just, a. there should be a consequence for not doing that. So then all of us can see what the, the, what the, um, the, the comprehensive reporting can and should look like. John, I couldn't agree more. I was just going to add the, the detail about 8can'twait.org. And this is just one of many organizations, but yes. you can donate. Um, we, can, we can donate to those organizations, as is probably obvious to everyone. And, you know, I want to just I want to punch something you said before, which is because, I, you know, again, you and I are teachers. I read. You got to go back. People have to go back to the 1619 Project. What a thing that the, 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 the Times media organization launched. The perspectives are, are incredible. There is some great long form journalism in there. Yep. You can listen to it, most of it. Um, those are, are great things as well. And then, John, you mentioned some of the other reading. The other thing I would add, and you know, it's been a theme through this whole conversation, it was for us the other day, which is, and it's my favorite subject, which is just listen, ask for people's stories. Yep. And, and don't be afraid to retell them. Like, John, I hope I can, I hope I can retell your story of your daughter and your son. And you, I've told your story um, since I met you a whole bunch of times. I hope I can do that um, because yeah. we've got to be able to tell each other stories. But you, in order to tell the stories, you got to have them. Right. And so I, th I don't know if anybody, do we tell the story about Ashley, my daughter? No, please do. Please okay, do. so real, real quick, I'll, I won't get to belabor it. I'm really proud of my daughter. I'm a proud dad. Uh, so she, you know, if you if you read the news reports or saw the the stuff that went went on in in Denver, there were there were some protests that happened, and you know, then they spiraled as we talk about. They they splintered and got out of control, um, and so we wanted to turn the the conversation back to the original point. And so my daughter was a co organizer of the first peaceful demonstration that happened up in. Uh, in Denver. And she worked with law enforcement. She worked with the, the mayor's office. She worked with the representatives uh, and brought these organizations together. And they were so organized that they were told that at a certain time, they were going to begin to disperse because Denver had a curfew that was going to be happening, was going to happen that evening. And they got word by their spies that were out there that law enforcement was actually moving in ahead of schedule. And so they calmly just told the crowd, we're going to just end this a little bit early right now. We want to make sure that you all get home safe. Do not incite, you know, do not agitate and just make sure that you're checking it back in. And so they had everything dialed in and that's the way. So nothing got out of control. It's fun because the agitators couldn't agitate. They shut their voices down and the looters that were going to come in, the police were still out. They, they couldn't, they couldn't loot because their, their job, right, is to take stuff and steal. But because they ended a little bit early, they they were um, they were thwarted from doing that. So that was I'm just really proud of her. Well, that is, uh, you know, the word that occurs to my mind, John, hearing that question about Ashley is discipline. I mean, Absolutely. what what tremendous discipline, which is also a part of crucial conversations is we have to have internal fortitude, discipline, grit, perseverance, whatever word you want to call it. But to not only get into these conversations but figure out our way through these conversations, thanks to folks like you and Ashley, and then figure out a way to move forward. Mm -hmm. and, and John, I want to mention before we close, you are doing this a lot, right? So you, I think tomorrow, you have a three generation conversation about race happening from your base in Colorado Springs. Is that correct? That's correct. If I can get my dad on, <laughs> that'd be great. But Come we got to we got to teach him another platform, and that's gonna that might be the challenge. <laughs> so it might be two generations with my with my daughter and myself at nine o'clock tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll have an event right out so that you can sign up, register for it. Uh, it's gonna be a great conversation to kind of hear from her perspective, uh, from the youth perspective. Maybe your, some of your children are asking you about these things, and you're wrestling on how to talk to them about these conversations. So it'll be great from youth to youth to, to hear that. This will be a nice family conversation that you can have. And again, it's a time to listen, hear stories, take those stories, and then repeat the stories so that we don't get lost in translation. Oh, 
that is a that is a great way to close. Look, I, I want to say thank you. I, I'm, I hope I can say this, John, on behalf of John and myself to this amazing LinkedIn community and LinkedIn for letting us be live. And uh, and John, um, thank you uh, for everything. You are a great gift to me. And, and thank you for the education and just helping me understand more and have the conversation. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate it, Craig. Thank you so much. Go forth, inspire your world, everybody. Be well. See you, everybody.